If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this episode, join John Parsons as he interviews friends and former employees of E.W. Hallett. Parsons discovers secrets that have never before been revealed and uses an archival audio interview of Hallett telling his own tale in this episode of Common Ground. You know, I don't think he ever really knew how much money he really had. I think uh, he knew it was a lot, but he didn't know how much. I think the people who ran his companies had been with him for years. How he found them in the beginning, I don't know. He was the visionary, and then he had the managers doing the vision. He would be somebody you would, you would want to be as a friend. He's a wonderful man. And his wife would be in partnership with him. And that they always did everything in partnership. The year was 1910. On the second day of February, Ernest Wilbert Hallett wed Jesse Fern Bernard. The partnership would last 66 years, and they would go on to become multi-millionaires with some 22 companies operating in eight states. It is a classic rags to riches story. He was the first child in this very, very poor family back in the days where he calls it, it was a greater depression than the depression we understand and that he was only allowed to go to school at certain times so his education was very limited as far as going to school. So he borrowed somebody's muskrat trap and uh, trapped a few muskrats and took the 60 or 70 cents that he made on that whole operation and bought himself a trap. And then I guess uh, what I would say the rest is history. The first time he met Jesse Bernard, E.W. Hallett was a contractor working up a sweat building a single span township bridge and lodging at the Bernard farm. He was 24 and as he put it, she was a blushing pretty girl of 15. It was iron mining that really put wind into the Hallett sails. The Cuyuna Range opened up in 1911 and drew a wave of immigration from Finland and the Balkans. The Hallets established a hardware store in Crosby that very same year. And that store went on to become the keystone of the Hallett business empire. They'd owned the store for 60 years. We got to know this man. We bought a hardware store and then come to find out you know, there's more and more of this, oh, he was involved in this and he was involved in this. And our first introduction to him was taking inventory. And because he valued a physical inventory, uh, that meant we count everything and weigh everything. And so it started out, uh, I think actually they could weigh the nails. But when we had rolls of linoleum, uh, instead of weighing the linoleum, you had to unroll it and measure it foot by foot. And so when we were finishing up, I think it was like three or four days of counting, 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 uh, Mr. Hallett and I were working together in the housewares department and we were counting uh, forks, and we were counting um, old mixing spoons, anything that was hanging there, and got to the end, kind of, and there were two pickle forks. And he said, we don't have to count these. There's one for you and one for me. 
So I still have my pickle fork from Mr. Hallett. By 1971, when Mr. Hallett was counting cutlery and giving away pickle forks, he was certainly a millionaire. But back in 1918, he was looking for a new challenge, although Jesse told him he had too much to do at the hardware store to take on any new projects. But Mr. Hallett was having none of it. I was down to a noca, and I saw a little paving going on at an intersection. And this appealed to me. I thought I'd like to do paving. So I come back and I talked to Pete Ostrand. Pete Ostrand was a, an engineer, and he had surveyed this road here for the county. The one in front of your house. Yeah. So I thought he would know something about it, and I went up and, and, and talked to him. And I told him that I was interested in getting into the concrete paving business. I didn't even know at that time that there was such a thing as washed aggregate. I had fixed the concrete out of for a few sidewalk works and a lot of my basement. So all I knew about it. And Pete said to me, he says, well, I am interested. I said, well, Pete, as long as you're interested, why don't we go together? Well, he says, that's fair enough. But he says, I haven't got any money. I said, I've got the same amount. Pallet had been operating in Crosby seven years. He was by no means penniless. By his own estimate, he was worth $50,000. Though, as he put it, all invested and not much cash in sight. He said, well, how would you want to go in? And I said, 50-50. He says, I can borrow $6,000 from my uncle. And I said, I think I can borrow $10,000 from the bank. So we decided we'd go in partnership. And we operated for a number of years. And that's all the agreement we ever had was just that. Just a verbal agreement. Just, just not any more than what you've got now. It would go in 50-50. That's all. But he'd furnish 6,000, I'd furnish 10. We never agreement. had any other, any other talk about any agreement. We got along till we built the job from Little Falls in 1926. From Little Falls to Brainerd, 26 miles. It was the biggest single paving job that had been done in the United States at that time. In February of 1924, tragedy struck the Cuyuna Range. Deep underground, miners felt a blast of warm wind, followed by a liquid roaring sound. Water from a nearby lake had broken through, and miners had just minutes to escape. Seven men made it out. Forty-one did not. Within 15 minutes, the whole mine was filled with water and mud. It took seven months to recover the last body. Seven years earlier, E.W. Hallett had added a line of caskets to his hardware store. By the time of the mining disaster, he had installed a graduate from undertaking school in his basement as the Crosby mortician. So he had uh, basically had a mortuary. And there was also a mortician in Ironton. And when the Milford mine disaster occurred, there was 41 miners trapped in the mine and died there. And the problem was to get them out of the mine and to the mortuary. Well, the guy in Ironton was kind of the closest to the mine from the, the road going out there. So he ran out there and he got all the clothes from the miners um, in the dry house from all them hanging, his, all their clothes was hanging in the dry house. And he got all the clothes from the miners that were killed and hauled them to Ironton to his mortuary and in, in preparation of getting the bodies and, and, and embalming and all the processes of, of burial. Well, Mr. Hallett got to talking with some of the wives, the widows and so forth. The ladies were wondering, well, you know, my husband, it, 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 it took over, I don't know how many months to get the last miner out of there. So everything was, uh, the bodies were in pretty tough shape. So the women were wondering, well, how can we have a service in the church with this decayed body? The smell would drive everybody crazy. He says, well, he says, you bring, you assign me the, the, the mortician job and I will guarantee that you will not have smell in the church from the body. So they agreed, okay. So they went over there and and uh, Mortician Ironton was quite upset about this and and uh, they all demanded the clothes from the, their husbands, 
clothes and so forth and so and the bodies and all that so the two morticians met at the town line from what I understand what he said and transferred the bodies from the Ironton mortician to his the Crosby mortician and the clothes and they came over and the the funeral home in Crosby prepared the bodies and Mr. Hallett, to guarantee that they didn't smell, it was a secret that nobody has, I guess, known. He didn't say how he did it. I know in the book you mentioned the Milford Mine disaster. Yeah. Would you feel comfortable telling us about how you managed to take care of those caskets at all? But he told me that what he did was he made a sheet metal box that put the body in, and it was all soldered together, so it was hermetically sealed, essentially. It was soldered together, and then that was put in the coffin, so that the body was in a hermetically sealed container. And that's how he kept his promise, that there would be no smell in the church. And I don't know that that story has ever got a, been written down or told at all, because that was strictly verbal. And at this point in time, which is 2013, 14, I don't think it makes a difference. The secret is out. I hope it doesn't anyway. Mm -hmm. Just three years later, tragedy struck the paving partnership of Ostrand and Hallett. And the next winter, it was operated on for appendicitis, and they didn't put in the proper drainage tubes. Paranitis set in and he died. He died. And when Mr. Ostrand died, the widow said, you know, something about taking over, and he said, oh, no, I was in partnership with your husband. You know, okay. I, we are not going to continue this as a partnership. So it was settled that way, and I went, I went on then doing business just as E.W. Hallett. There was no work coming up in Minnesota, so I had to go to Wisconsin to get work. Now, there again, there's a long story to tell you about it. I don't want to go into it. But you did do paving in Wisconsin. That's yeah. when you... Um, would you call that the turning point of your career? Shut it off. It is unclear why Mr. Hallett chose not to discuss this turning point in his life. What is clear is that after Pete Ostrin died and Mr. Hallett agreed to buy out his widow, the Hallett Construction Company went from strength to strength and gave birth to a whole string of companies. But first, Mr. Hallett would bring in Jesse as an equal partner. He was signing the papers or writing the papers, and then it had to do with E.W. Hallett, and he decided, no, it should be Hallett Construction, and his wife would be in partnership with him. About that time, too, we found that in California, they were allowing a man and his wife, each one, to give in their property, property separate and, and have an advantage on income tax. But other states didn't allow that. So then I thought if I organized the company, the Hallett Construction Company, and give Mrs. Hallett a half interest, why they'd have to accept it. So then we organized the company at $200,000, and she got half of it, and I got half of it. Well, at that time, when I was organizing this company and giving her half the stock, the attorneys, are you sure you want to do that? I said, certainly, because you certainly have a lot of faith in that woman. Isn't that an awful remark for that Yeah. You had reason to have a lot of faith in her. Yes, sure did. Yeah. She was doing a lot of your bookkeeping, wasn't she? Yes. She never, she didn't do the bookkeeping for the company. No. It was our personal bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say that she had taken a night class to learn to help that way? She took a night class to learn bookkeeping to help us out. She took a night class to study, to study geology to help us to get information on locating aggregates. During the Depression, the bank in Crosby collapsed. Mr. Hallett was determined to have a bank in town. The bank failed. It was a Hazlitt bank. And uh, I went to Minneapolis to see the first bank stock company down there and asked them if they would come up and reorganize the bank and get it going. And they said, no, we've got too many banks now. We uh, have a good bank in Bridger, and we might fix up a depository at Crosby. 
says, no, a depository won't do. You've got to have a bank at Crosby. If you won't do it, I'll do it myself. He says, now listen, you have been pretty successful in your contracting business, but you don't know anything about banking. Leave it alone. I said, no, we're going to get the bank going. If you won't do it, I'm going to go ahead. Hmm. Was it during that time that you had some money printed up with your own name? Yes, it was. But that many years ago, when the West was opening up, they passed a law where new banks could buy a certain amount of government securities. I don't remember the interest rate, but it was small. And then they could turn that, about these securities, and they were getting the interest on it. But they could put up that paper as security. And for that security, the bank, uh, the, the government would, uh, it was $25,000. They would print $25,000 worth of bank notes for that bank in their name. And that way, it, it'd give them practically $25,000 more capital than the mm -hmm. And at that time, we had some of them smoke there. So your name was actually right on the money then? Oh, I've got, I got, I got a couple of ten dollar bills yet with my name on yeah. As the Depression took hold in the early 30s, the Army Corps of Engineers was getting ready to build locks and dams between St. Paul and St. Louis. The Halleck companies joined forces to form the United Construction Company and bid on Mississippi River dams. His other companies, the uh, construction companies, built most of the locks and dams in the North Mississippi River through the Minneapolis and uh, Iowa area. Building a lock and a dam back in the 30s and somewhere in that area uh, was a monstrous thing because they had steam engines doing all the lifting and all the concrete placing and all that stuff. And everything was done by hand and all with track and ties and wood and timbers and all the stuff. They didn't have any of the modern machinery of today. And to, to take on a project like that, to build a massive dam and a lock, takes a lot of initiative, fortitude, or whatever you want to call it, to even think about bidding on something like that. But most of his construction companies had managers that he had picked out that were well uh, educated and, and could do the job. Hallett's companies would go on to build dams in Colorado and New Mexico. They would also build Navy docks in California, Massachusetts, and Alabama. And during the Second World War, they poured a lot of concrete for airports around the country. In 1945, Hallett was commended by the Secretary of State for War for work essential to the production of the atom bomb. Hallett records that he delivered 850,000 cubic yards of concrete to the Hanford engineer site in the state of Washington. Another writer records that the Hanford site consumed some 780,000 cubic yards of concrete. Whichever account is correct, it is likely that a Hallett company was the principal contractor. Hanford is the site of the world's first full-scale plutonium reactor and it was begun under great secrecy in 1943. Hallett records that the job took him 11 months to complete. Hallett also notes that a shell loading plant in Dixon, Illinois was a rush job, employing 200 people and costing some $45 million. Hallett appears to have taken the profits from his defense contracts and set up several new ventures. In 1945, with road building at a standstill, he set up a coal mining operation in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. When the coal was done, he moved on to strip mining iron ore in the state of Minnesota. Ultimately, he set up the Hallett Dock in the port of Duluth Superior, and that company is still in existence today. He got another outfit that worked out in the Dakotas and they built a lot of the Minuteman missile silos all over Dakotas, Montana. Also in 1945, Mr. Hallett bought a failed property development in Florida for $212,000. That property development is today the city of Bel Air. He says when he bought that down there, the sand was blowing 
through the development and it was like sand was curb to curb. I mean, you couldn't see the streets. It was pretty well covered up. So he bought that whole area of Bel Air in Clearwater, Florida. And that's probably one of the most expensive areas you can buy a house in in Florida today. And the area between the highway and the ocean, which was a boulevard, was wanting to be developed and he deeded it to the city with a restriction on it that they cannot build anything there. That has to be public property and uh, it should be non-developed and, and leave that open space. So that was part of his gift to the city. E.W. and Jesse Hallett were known for their generosity. In the early days, he gave away silverware. I knew that at the church, he would give, um, if, if a young person in the choir were not drinking and smoking, that for the girls, he would give them a full silver service set, which meant coffee, cream, or all of those. And the boys, he said, they can take care of themselves. <laughs> but he was very generous. He's a philanthropist. He put many, many kids through college helped them with their college education. Many, many kids, nobody knows how many. Later, E.W. Hallett would spend $200,000 to build this church and considerably more to create the library across the street in memory of his wife, Jessie. The house behind me is the former Hallett Mansion. Mrs. Hallett was known for keeping a beautiful and comfortable home, but she did confess to a friend that the one thing she most desired was her husband's time, something that was always in short supply. And I remember sitting at the hospital with him on a little chair, a little bench across from her room, basically holding his hand and being his friend as his wife was dying. And I, there was nobody else, I don't know why, there at the time. My wife was caring for her and I was caring for him at that point. And then, uh, when he died, uh, things were a little different. Nobody was allowed to visit him in the room even. Before they died, E.W. and Jesse had created charitable trust to benefit the Crosby community they loved so much. I met them in 1970. And at that time, they were good customers of U.S. Bank. Or now U.S. Bank at that time was called First National Bank of Minneapolis. And then they were interested in what they were going to do someday down the road. They had no children and no interest in where their funds went and they thought they had to create something. So we really enticed them or talked them into the idea of setting up perpetual charitable trusts. Uh, and eventually all of their funds ended up in those two trusts. And one in his name is Ernest Hallett and the other one is his wife, Jessie Fern Hallett and uh, they've been going ever since, and they're go going to last into perpetuity, we hope, which is a long time away, I guess. In 2013, the Hallett Charitable Trust disclosed assets of $13.5 million in their IRS filing. Trustees make regular visits to the area, and according to their website, the trust gives away, on average, a million dollars every year. I was at his 100th birthday party, and he got up in front of a whole group of people and gave a nice little talk. And he was also presented in St. Paul as an entrepreneur of Minnesota. And there was about three, 400 people in this auditorium. And there was about four big names of people that were being introduced as award winners. And he got by far the biggest applause of all of them. He was about 98 years old at the time. With this the award that he received, being a leading businessman in St. Paul kind of highlighted the fact that he was somebody in the state that there wasn't many with. But the head of Medtronics was one of them in the, who was recognized at the same time. Ernest Wilbert Hallett is buried here in Crosby next to his wife. Their two sons lie next to them. One died in infancy. The other had developmental difficulties and passed away in his 20s. But E.W. outlived them all. He had just turned 101 when he passed away in 1983. How did you get the experience so you would even dare jump into a new field? I got my experience all my life by doing things. 
Nothing needed to be done, I went at it. Thank you for watching. Join us again next week for another episode of Common Ground. If you have an idea for a Common Ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.